Hello. Today I'm going to talk a little bit about ancient Greece, ancient Greek tragedy, and the Athenian tragedy of the 5th century. Uh, we'll talk about some of the developments of it, some of the context of it, and we'll also talk a little bit about Aristotle and his analysis of Greek tragedy, which comes a little bit later. So, uh, as with everything in the theater history class, we're going to talk about the four elements, actors, audience, space, and text. But we're going to begin by talking about the roots of Greek drama. Uh, we do know that Greek tragedy, for example, has a sort of uh, um, two different strains of influence that create it somewhere in the early or rather late 6th century BCE, around the 530 BCE. And the two roots are ritual, which we've already talked about a little bit, uh, Greek ritual, civic ritual, which we'll talk about in a moment when we talk about the Festival of Dionysus, and the epic. Uh, epic being things like the, the poems of Homer, the Iliad, the Odyssey are the ones that are the most well known. There are many others and there are other oral traditions and other mythic traditions that also participate in it. But essentially we're looking at these two things coming together sometime in the 6th century BCE to create what we then end up calling, uh, knowing as Greek tragedy in the 5th century. And during the period of the 5th century, is off, off 5th century BCE, is often called the Golden Age of Athens. The period essentially is from 479 BC to 404 BC, and that's the period um, from the victory over the Persian Empire in 479 to the end of the Peloponnesian War, which ends in 404 BCE. But before we get to talking about the theater itself, we should talk about the context of it, the ritual context of it, the religious context of Greek tragedy. And, of course, the Festival of Dionysus, which is the festival that Greek tragedy was presented at in the 5th century, uh, is based, uh, or rather is for the god Dionysus. So, who is, Gai who is Dionysus? What is he the god of? Well, we know that he's the god of theater, uh, but he's also the god of wine and of fertility, and also of madness. Uh, madness especially brought about by wine or uh, those kinds of things. So if you think about Dionysus himself, he actually has a sort of um, a good and a bad within him, right? He's sort of um, polarized. So if you think about each of those things, wine, right? Wine has positive elements. It releases inhibitions. It allows for freedom and liberation. Uh, it makes people happy. It makes them dance and sing. But of course, if you drink too much, you end up doing things that you might regret or and or you end up the next day or maybe even for multiple days uh, hungover, right? unhappy, uh, physically miserable, etc. Fertility, sex. We can look at similarly. Uh, you know, the, the feeling, the pleasurable sensations of sexual relations on the positive side but also the consequences of sexuality, not just the potential for procreation, which may or may not be what's desired given the context, but also disease and sexual violence, which of course is not something that we can separate entirely from uh, those kinds of events. So if we look at the duality of those two elements of Dionysus, we can also look at that duality in terms of theater. Theater has potentially positive aspects, the social aspects, the community aspects, the narrative storytelling, and the potential for learning, which we'll talk about in a little bit when we talk about Aristotle. But there's also potential dangers, and this is something that Plato especially, in his writings about the theater, is attuned to. And if, when we look at many histories of theater, we're going to see lots of places where there are, there are prohibitions on theater because of its potential dangers. What are those dangers? Well, uh, the danger of getting a big group of people together, potentially thousands of people together, that they might have some sort of political response that doesn't fit into the paradigm, the political paradigm, the hierarchy that exists. Uh, there's the potential for that. There's the potential for psychological damage. Uh, we certainly have examples of actors and spectators in the contemporary age who have suffered greatly <clears throat> because of theatrical or other kinds of performance experiences. Um, so Dionysus as a god has a duality, right? He's good, but he can also be potentially bad. And as a metaphor for theater, the Dionysian is a very effective one and a very interesting one and a very useful one. So who were the actors in 5th century uh, Greece? 
The actors were citizens. Now, what did it mean to be a citizen? Well, a citizen in, in the 5th century in Athens was a white, or a Greek, landowning male, someone who had property. So it wasn't everyone. These were the people who participated in the democracy. They were also the people who participated in the military, the government, etc. But what that means is that a significant portion of the population of 5th century Athens was not a part of this democracy, nor do we think were they much of a part of the Greek tragic festivals. Um, upward to 30% of the population were slaves, um, not necessarily just foreign slaves or slaves from other countries, but they're also a slave class within Athens itself. And then, of course, um, you know, almost half of the population was women, who also were not part of the political process and had very few rights as we think of them today in terms of democracy. Um, they were essentially um, kept in the home and did not participate in the political processes. They had social processes that involved the marketplace, but that was the lim that, those were essentially the limitations of it. So if we do the math on that, we're talking about 70 to 80 percent of the population of ancient Athens didn't participate in democracy and also didn't participate much in the theatrical events. Now there's some argument about this and it's worth debating uh, amongst historians how much women might have been allowed or, or slaves might have been allowed to view some of these performances, we're pretty sure that they weren't prohibited entirely, but that the population that participated from that group would have been very, very small. The women were probably mostly non-Greek. They might have been, um, you know, spouses or um, concubines of foreign uh, diplomats, uh, foreign emissaries who might have been at the tragic festivals, etc. What else do we know about the actors themselves? Well, the actors were, um, they began, first of all, as I said, around 530 BCE. Uh, the first actor, this is anecdotal, it's an urban myth, we don't actually have the documented evidence of this, was perhaps a gentleman named Thespis, from whence we, from whence we get the term thespian. Uh, and apparently Thespis came out from the chorus. The chorus was part of the, the festival of Dionysus before then. The chorus, which at that point would have been probably around 50 young men of military age uh, who performed choral dithrams. And dithrams were third-person narrative stories, song cycles, um, again, using epic material, the stories of the Trojan War, of Odysseus's return, uh, of the gods, etc., Probably around 460, Aeschylus added a second actor, right? But until then, there was only one actor in dialogue with the, uh, with the chorus. And then a third, um, a little bit after that, maybe by Sophocles. Uh, obviously, what do additional characters do? Well, they add elements to the plot from the outside, as the chorus could not leave. So we also have the convention that we see in Greek tragedy of messengers, as they were likely the only way to add information. They were all men performing in these plays, even in women's roles. Masks were used, uh, and that would affect not just the voice and the facial expressions, but also the entire body and style of physical movement. As I said, the citizens were probably 30,000 or so landowning males, um, and while they had, we talk about Greece as being the cradle of democracy, and it was democracy for that oligarchy. Uh, during the 5th century, uh, Athens establishes itself as the primary military and political power in the Mediterranean. Um, again, by defeating the Persians in 479 BC, uh, they uh, established themselves as the leading power and actually served a sort of imperial or colonial role during that period. They annexed and took over many different places and made them part of the Athenian Empire. Um, and that actually led also to their sort of demise uh, when they sort of overreached and in trying to take on Sparta uh, from the long Peloponnesian War, which lasted from 431 BCE to 404 BCE, Athens eventually loses, which causes civil and political strife. Many different governments governments were changing constantly during that period, that 27-year period, from dictatorships to democracies back to dictatorships, etc. So the last 25, 27 years or so of 5th century Athens, the so-called Golden Age, was actually filled with strife 
Um, and many of the plays that we have, Sophoc most of Sophocles and Euripides' plays, actually come from that period, um, from between 431 and 404. So where was the theater, the space? The theater was in the Agora, which was the marketplace. And uh, it developed from the marketplace, and eventually the city Dionysia, or the theater of Dionysus, is created in the place where the Agora used to be. If you go to Athens now, the remains of the theater of Dionysus are on the side of the hill, on the top of which is the Acropolis, which of course was the central uh, place of government. So you can see its proximity to the political process. Again, if you think of contemporary analogies, you know, if you look at Times Square, Midtown, Broadway theaters, they're in New York, uh, but they're not even near the central government of New York City, which is downtown, right? City Hall is way down near Wall Street. And if you think about it in terms of the national uh, government, then obviously if we're, if we're thinking of New York Broadway theater as the sort of primary, um, the most evident theater in the United States, um, then it's not anywhere near Washington, D.C. or Capitol Hill or anything like that. The closest example we might have of that is something like the Kennedy Center. But the Kennedy Center is not really a, a theater in the sense that a Greek theater certainly was, um, and they really don't present, you know, they present stuff there, um, but it's mostly a sort of lecture and concert hall as opposed to a real theater. So the theater happened in this central space, central to the political and civic life of Athens, of the community. The festival of Dionysus took place over five days. The first day was probably involved some sort of sacrifice or at least religious ceremonies, sacrifices to Dionysus, um, libations, uh, wine, water, honey, oil poured into the ground before a meal or in honor of the dead. The second day even into the 5th century, would have been taken up by dithyrambic choruses, retelling myths and stories. The choruses, again, were made up of these military-age men, the same, the same age men that would have been performing in the tragedies. Uh, those choruses were of about 50. The third day might have t had some comedies, um, but we do know that by the fourth day they were performing tragedies, and there were two or three days of tragedies, usually three days. Um, and each day featured the tragedies of one playwright who wrote a trilogy. Um, we only have one extant trilogy, um, which is the Oresteia, Aeschylus' trilogy. There aren't any other extant trilogies. There are three plays that involve Oedipus, written by Sophocles, but they were written decades apart. We put them together as um, the Theban plays, but they weren't written as a trilogy. So you have a trilogy, then you have a fourth short satirical play called a satyr play, S-A-T-Y-R, and that of course is where we get the word satire. And it would have been a short play after the three tragedies that would have somehow contextualized and sort of made fun of some of the issues that the tragedies themselves might have addressed. As I said before, we know the Greek tragedy grew out of the tradition of these choral poems, the dithyrams sung in praise of Dionysus. Um, from the earliest times, the Greeks worshipped Dionysus in a theatrical form through masks, costumes, music, dance. And then again, with that dithram, you also have the oral tradition, where the stories came from and the mythology, Homer, the, bars, the bards, telling the story in the third person form. And in this festival, we have lots of ritual aspects. For example, there are rites of passage, there's divine recognition, there's civic recognition. All of those things are part of the festival. Um, in many cases, writ large, especially the civic recognition, some of them a little bit more subtly, perhaps, in the rite of passages. But if you think about the military age men participating in the process, that's a rite of passage in and of itself. A little bit more about the space. Uh, make sure that you look in your text and look at other images of the Greek theaters. We'll look at some when I am back uh, and we're face to face. But that uh, theater of Dionysus comes from the Dionysiac setting of the dithyrambic rituals. And the space itself is called the Theatron, T-H-E-A-T-R-O-N. And Theatron comes from the Greek meaning viewing space. And this is important to think about. Where the audience sat for Greek tragedy was called the viewing space. This is in contrast to a term that we often use for performance spaces, which is auditorium. And if you look at the roots of auditorium, which is a 
a room and a Latin word, not a Greek word, audi, right, which is hearing. That's a hearing space. The Greeks were very focused on it being a viewing space. The orchestra is the dancing space for the chorus. It's the roundish, oval-esque part down at the bottom of the, of the seating in the middle. It's the strongest viewing point in the space. And the one at the Theater of Dionysus was thought to be about 20 meters across. So that's six, about 60 feet across, which is fairly large. And the space itself had a large audience. It's built into the side of the hillside. The natural structure probably sat somewhere between 15 and 20,000 people. And almost 100 meters from the orchestra to the last rows. If you think about it in terms of a space, it's more like a basketball arena, right? Like Madison Square Garden or something like that. More like a rock concert than a, a theater for us. Uh, Broadway theaters hold somewhere between, you know, six or seven hundred people. The smallest ones up to a couple thousand people, but nothing anywhere near that approximation of fifteen to twenty thousand. So that's a little background on the space and the context of the Festival of Dionysus, where tragedy was performed in the fifth century. Now, when we look at Aristotle we're talking about a different perspective on tragedy than really would have taken place during the 5th century. The first thing to think about Aristotle is that he's writing a century after uh, the sort of pinnacle of tragedy. If you look at the dates, Aristotle writes the Poetics in 335 BCE, Oedipus the King, which is the example that he focuses the most on, is performed in 427 or 428 BCE, so that's almost 100 years. And a lot changes in Greek culture and society in that time. We'll talk about that a little bit more in class. But I want to focus a little bit first on Aristotle's definition of tragedy so that we can relate that to some of the things we know about the Greek context. First, uh, the, the first part of the, of the definition of tragedy. Tragedy, then, is the imitation of an action that is serious, complete, and of a certain magnitude, in language embellished with each kind of artistic ornament, the several kinds being found in separate, separate parts of the play, in the form of action, not narrative, through pity and fear affecting the proper purgation, or catharsis, of these emotions. So, we're going to talk about that definition more in class, but I want to make sure that you focus on some of the important elements of it. It's the imitation of an action. It's not the thing itself, right? So tragedy, as Aristotle says, it is not something that happens in real life. It's an imitation of an action. Um, the separate parts of the play refers to the choral odes and dialogue sections. Uh, Greek tragedy is literally structured in different parts. And then the form of action, not narrative. And this is what distinguishes it from epic. When you have the imitative mode, the mimetic mode of tragedy, you move from narration, right, where someone's talking in the third person. This is the story of Oedipus to the first person, an actor saying, I am Oedipus, right? That's the difference between narrative, the third person storytelling mode, and imitation, the first, ter first person storytelling mode. That's a significant change, obviously but it's something that happens in that 5th century with tragedy. The other thing that I want to mention about Aristotle uh, before we talk about him more in class is the six elements and how he lists them and why that order of importance is significant. The first thing he talks about is plot. Plot is the ordering of incident, incidents, the structure of events. And um, Aristotle talks specifically about several plot points. The reversal, the recognition, and the scene of suffering are the ones that are the most important and that we'll talk about in relationship to both Oedipus and um, Medea. The second part, and the second in order of importance, is character. And Aristotle compares plot and character to painting. Uh, the chalk outline of a painting is the plot, right, the structure. And the character are the colors. So you can have a plot that is something that is readable, that is understandable. The character only provides the color. The third that he lists is diction or language. The fourth is thought. The fifth is song, and the sixth is spectacle. Um, we'll talk more specifically about reversal recognition and the scene of suffering in class when we refer it to the plays that we'll be reading. But I'd like you to think about what those plot points might be in the plays when we get there.
Lastly, what is the goal of tragedy for Aristotle? What should it create for an audience? Well, if you look at the definition, uh, he's looking at this idea of catharsis, right? Through pity and fear affecting the proper purgation or catharsis of these emotions. So the goal of tragedy for Aristotle is catharsis through pity and fear. We're going to talk about these terms very specifically in class, but I'd like you to start to think about why you might need both, why both pity and fear, and what catharsis is, uh, which is an eternal question that has been being asked for 2,500 years. We won't solve it, but we're going to ask about it too. All right? Um, so that's all for this, and like I said, we'll be talking about this in class extensively as well. Thank you.